it's time to get to our teaching this morning. Would you turn with me in your Bible, please, to 1 Samuel chapter 25. 1 Samuel 25. This morning, we will linger in a fifth study in the life of David. We have had a wonderful time thus far. This is going to carry us for many more weeks and months. There's a lot to learn from the life of David. And this morning, we focus in on another one of the relationships attached to David. So this morning is entitled, David and Abigail. David and Abigail. It was on New Year's Day that I had the great privilege of officiating a wedding for two participants in our congregation. This young man and woman had been engaged for some time and the day finally arrived. And it's one of my great privileges to stand alongside a bride and a groom as they commit their lives to each other. I have the best seat in the house, I like to say. I get to stand right next to the groom as his bride enters the building, as his bride walks down the aisle. And this, this particular wedding was so winsome on so many levels. But I think my favorite moment was the moment that Austin saw his bride, Michaela, because tears formed in his eyes, began to run down his face. I just can't help myself, guys. You know I'm a little emotional. You know that about me. And I'm just done at that moment. I'm like, I'm done. It hasn't even begun. I haven't even said a word. And I'm misting up, right? It's just so beautiful to me. It was a beautiful wedding, and that was my favorite moment of the wedding. It was beautiful. Today, we're going to meet a character that David ends up marrying. She becomes his wife, but oh, what a story transpires before he marries her. And that's what we want to study today. Abigail appears briefly in the text. She's pretty much only in 1 Samuel 25. I mean, there's little hints of her after this. But this is her primary moment in the biblical narrative. She shows up. She's kind of there in the background here forward. But boy, does she make an impression on us as the, as the reader. And she's useful for the writer of David's life to help develop his character. We're going to learn more about David through his attachment and experience with Abigail. Now, we've spent a month establishing the background to David's introduction within the biblical story, learning of his earliest years. And before we meet him, in fact, the very first thing we learn about him, before we even hear his name, is that he's God's choice as king for Israel. And that he is as such because he's a man who has a heart after God. He's the youngest son of a man named Jesse. He's a shepherd boy when we meet him. And our initial impression of David is quite glowing, is it not? We are given a remarkable first impression of David. He's, he's a man of tremendous conviction in terms of the character of God. And he's also a man who is marked by a great deal of courage born of his experience in God. So we're quite taken with David. Now, we see a little bit of, of the ambition that we'll see later in his life that could forecast some trouble. But nothing yet has bubbled up that's clearly out of line with his designation as God's choice for king. Early on, we learn that David is a, a talented musician and songwriter. His skill is marked by the Spirit of God, so much so that he has a ministry that comforts the tormented King Saul. These are the things we've learned about David thus far. But one of the things we're going to see here forward is that so much of David's story is told through the lens of the relationships that are attached to him. It was a few weeks ago that Pastor Mark did a remarkable job walking us through the story of David and Jonathan. Jonathan, a resplendent figure, right? The seeming heir to the throne. Today, as we study about Abigail, a, another important character in David's life, teach us, she teaches us things about David. Now, let's, let's do a little more review to, to set the table. You, you'll recall this slide of the Old Testament timeline, which I'm not going to linger on, because I have in previous weeks of study. 
But we're coming off the time of the judges. We will we'll recall that we learned about Samuel, and it was through Samuel's anointing that first Saul became king of Israel, and then he anointed David to follow Saul, that David was God's choice in the midst of the people's choice that would prove to be Saul. I want to show you a different timeline. This is the timeline of David's life, and there's a whole lot going on here. So you're like, dear God, what are you doing to me, Chris? This all makes sense. So I'm going to point out some things here on the TV, and then I'll quickly jump to the screen for those of you who are presently staring at my back. My apologies. What you'll see on the left, of course, is David's age, and you'll see the timeline that coincides with David's age. David lived to 70 years of age, and he reigned for 40 years as king. Now, there's some complexity there, future weeks of our teaching series. The reign of kings is over here on the right portion of this timeline. So first you'll see the 40 years of Saul, then you'll see the 40 years of David, and then you'll see at the very bottom, he who follows David, his son Solomon. And here's some important happenings of David's life. The happenings that we've studied thus far are when David's a young man. He's a teenager, right? David killed Goliath in 1 Samuel 17 as a teenager. He becomes a court musician and minister to King Saul in his late teens, somewhere around 20 years of age. This is what we've studied thus far. Now, we aren't able to pinpoint the happening of of David's life like to a very specific date on the timeline or exactly how old he was. But what we do know is when he became king in Hebron, when he became king over all of Israel and moved towards Jerusalem and of course the date of his death. So a lot of this is like an educated guess in terms of exactly when it happened. But it will help us. We're going to be referencing this over the course of the study of David's life. Now, look with me up on the screen here as we summarize other details. It's in 1 Samuel 18 that we learn that David becomes a successful militarist and held a high rank in the army of Israel. And it is in 1 Samuel 18 we hear a refrain that will cause actually a lot of trouble for David. Uh, The young women of Israel are singing that Saul has slain his thousands and David, his tens of thousands. Saul, who's proven to be an insecure leader, is going to be deeply troubled by this. Jealousy begins to consume him towards David. We then read in 1 Samuel 18 that Saul makes his first attempt on David's life and when unsuccessful, sought to make him his (laughs) son-in-law. Yep, the story's messed up. Welcome to the human story. Makes an attempt on David's life, and then he's like, well, what's the old saying? Friends close, enemies closer? Yeah. So actually, Saul's way out of bounds already because when they were facing down Goliath and the Philistines, do you remember what he said? Whoever kills him will get numerous things, including a tax-free life, oh, and he'll become my son-in-law. I'll give my daughter to him. Well, that daughter is named Merib, his oldest, but he's already given Merib to a different man. He's not given Merib to David. But he learns that another one of his daughters named Michael is in love with David. And so after another successful military campaign, Saul gives Michael to David. There's a lot more complexity there, but suffice it to say, that's what we need to know at this moment. 1 Samuel 19, Saul makes his second attempt on David's life. And then in 1 Samuel 20, Saul's plans to end David become known to Jonathan. And David flees and he goes into hiding, initially going to Philistine territory, as we read in 1 Samuel 21. Now, ironically, this is quite, you just think, how could this even be? He actually goes to Goliath's hometown of Gath. You're like, really? Of all the places, David, you could pick, you go to the Philistine giant's hometown that you you killed on the battlefield and provided a great victory to Israel. And again, just, just realize how different the world was then compared to now, right? I mean, we'd know all about it on Twitter, or X, excuse me. We'd know all about it on Instagram. 
I mean, David, David's face would be plastered everywhere. That wasn't true in the ancient world. And he was like, at this point, he was well known in Israel and his enemies knew of David, but his face wasn't plastered everywhere. But here, here's the, as soon as his cover is blown, as soon as the Philistine regional king goes, wait a minute, isn't this the guy they sing about? Saul's killed his thousands, David is tens of thousands, by the way, most of them Philistines. Isn't this, and David becomes fearful and this is when he acts insane. He physically feigns to be losing his mind and he is let go by the Philistines. He's like, get this guy out of my court. And David leaves and he writes a song about it that we have in the Psalms. We learn in 1 Samuel 22 that David attracts a band of 400 men loyal to him initially. And he functions as their commander. It's at this point that David's family goes into hiding because of Saul's murderous threats against him. They go into hiding in Moab. And then in 1 Samuel 23, David and his men continue to have conflicts with the Philistines all while they are being chased by Saul in the wilderness of Israel. And so we're going to show you a little bit of imagery from our last trip to Israel here of one of the spaces mentioned in this wilderness time of running. And it's a place called En Gedi. And it is one of my favorite places on the planet. En Gedi is actually set apart right now in Israel as a national park. And as you'll see, one of the reasons it became a safe harbor is it's in the middle of the desert near the Dead Sea, but water runs through it. And so this is one of the spaces that David would hide in caves, such as the one you're looking at, to avoid Saul and those who are chasing him. Now, back to our list. 1 Samuel 24 t teaches us that Saul continues to chase David in the wilderness. And it, it happens that Saul finds where David and his men are, but they're hiding and so while Saul goes into a cave to relieve himself, this is part of our study next week, David spares his life. He will not lay his hand on Saul. That brings us, in short order, towards our text of study today in 1 Samuel 25 and David's happening with Abigail. We're going to study initially from 1 Samuel 25 verses 1 through 13. Let's begin with verses 1 through 3. Now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him. And they buried him at his home in Ramah. Then David moved down into the desert of Paran. A certain man in Maon, who had property there at Carmel, was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats and 3,000 sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband was surly and mean in his dealings. He was a Calebite. So our story here in 1 Samuel 25 begins with the loss of potentially David's most powerful ally in Samuel. And in light of it, the narrator tells us this to help us understand why David stays on the move. David's on the move. And he lands in different spots in what is known as the wilderness of southeastern Israel. It's a wilderness that's bordering again on the Dead Sea, which means you know what time it is. What time is it? It's time for a map, which I didn't, I didn't actually get to the screen last time, so I'm going to the screen this time. Forgive me. So what you're looking at here is the Dead Sea. When we go to the Dead Sea in Israel, we usually stay at a hotel right here and we float right here, right? But En Gedi, the national park we visit that I showed you images of is right here. So the, the story that we're reading right now is happening right here. So Nabal and Abigail live right here and about a mile up the road, there's Carmel where they keep their flock. There was a wealthy man who lived in this region, Nabal, and his wife's Abigail. Now, now, Nabal, as the story will later tell us, Nabal means fool. Rest assured, his parents didn't name him that, okay? They're not that cruel. But rather, much like Judas, we would say, oh, he's a Judas. What does that mean? He's a traitor. 
or Benedict Arnold. Oh, he's a Benedict Arnold. Much like whatever they did defines their name, if you will, so Nabal becomes synonymous with being a fool. So Nabal, as it would happen, became the meaning or it became a word associated with saying fool. So Nabal is the fool, which previews some of what's about to happen. Meanwhile, Abigail is smart and beautiful, a potent combination. The word specifically used uh, and translated here in English as intelligent, it has a moral quality. So it's not just a mental aptitude. It's not just that she's bright of mind. There is a discerning of moral quality that is true about Abigail. And as we meet these two characters, it's almost as if we're meeting the personification of the two ways that we read in the book of Proverbs, right? This collection of wisdom literature of ancient Israel. There's the way of the fool, and there's the way of wisdom. And Nabal, whose name becomes synonymous with foolishness, and Abigail, this personification of wisdom. Now, to further emphasize that Nabal was not only wealthy and prominent, but was actually uh, held in the highest regard within the Israelite community, was not due to his character, but it was due to his ancestry. He's a Calebite. And do you remember who Caleb is? Caleb was one of the two faithful spies sent out by Moses to look at the promised land. Joshua and Caleb. He's a descendant of Caleb. Too bad he's not like him. Let's keep going. Verses 4 through 9. While David was in the wilderness, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. Woohoo! Time of celebration. So he sent 10 young men and said to them, Go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. Say to him, Long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours. Now I hear that it is sheep shearing time. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them. And the whole time they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. Ask your own servants, they'll tell you, Nabal. Therefore be favorable toward my men, since we come at a festive time. Please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for them. When David's men arrived, they gave Nabal this message in David's name. Then they waited. This is something of an odd scene for us, isn't it? I mean, I think to our current sensibilities, this would seem a bit presumptuous of David. But let's set it in its ancient context. We have to work a little, a little hard to understand a 3,000-year-old Israelite culture. But, but we can situate this in a way that it causes us to make a bit more sense of it. The one in which we're reading of this culture it prized hospitality. And what you realize is Middle Eastern culture still, 3,000 years later, prizes hospitality. Hospitality is the gateway to everything. Hospitality is the gateway to ongoing relationship in the Middle East. Uh, hospitality is the gateway to business deals. If you're going to the Middle East to do a business deal, it ain't going to be a quick one. Just know that, right? So hospitality is prized above all things. And when we read the Hebrew Scriptures, our Old Testament, we actually see all of the ways in which hospitality is practiced. Strangers are welcomed into homes. Hospitality. So this is a, a culture of hospitality, a culture that prizes trying to welcome those who aren't part of the family unit. It's also an honor-shame culture. We have honor-shame cultures on, on the planet today. What's an honor-shame culture? It's a little different from the construct, a lot different than the one we function in. But I, I think it will help us realize that as there's an interplay between Nabal and David, David feels very shamed. And he obviously is going to make decisions based on that. It's also worth us mentioning that shearing time was, as the text tells us, a festive time. This was a point of celebration because 
The flock had been healthy. It was time to shear them. I'm actually wearing wool. I don't wear wool. This was not intentional, but I'm just realizing, like, how fortuitous, right? Wool is warm. You can make clothing out of it. You can make money off of it. You can clothe your family in it. So it's a festive time. It's a time of, like, we've worked hard. Let's celebrate. Meaning Nabal had lots of food prepared for the time of shearing for his workforce. So David is not being presumptuous in recognizing that there's going to be some food around. Let us also recognize that David and his men are on the run. They probably find themselves in greater need than would be usual for them. They're probably hungry. And David, as the commander, feels the burden of making sure that there is provision for his team, if you will. So David's request is born of need, and it's reasonable within the construct of the culture. He further justifies it by sending men who will honor. In an honor-shame culture, they approach Nabal with honor. Ten men, not one, not two, ten. He would have noticed this. It was a whole consortium. It was a whole delegation from David sent to Nabal. And they are armed with words of honor. You are a great man, essentially, is what they're saying. And we recognize this. We're brothers. We're all Israelites. And one of the things that we've done is we've kept raiding parties from bringing harm, Nabal, to your people and your flock. We've done that. And oh, by the way, we're kind of a raiding party. (laughs) You know what we read? They were regularly raiding Philistines, right? We're kind of a raiding party, but we didn't do that to you. And so, in light of the good we've done to you, would you do this good to us in our time of need? This is the situation that we're reading here in 1 Samuel 25. Let's continue verse 10. Nabal answered David's servants, Who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered for my shearers, and give it to men coming from who knows where. David's men turned around and went back. When they arrived, they reported every word. David said to his men, each of you strap on your sword. So they did, and David strapped his on as well. Remind you in the biblical story, that's the sword of Goliath. Now, we're not sure he constantly used that, but that's the sword mentioned in the narrative. It would be a big sword to carry around on a daily basis. Okay, so they did. David strapped on his as well. About 400 men went up with David, while 200, oh, it's grown. 400, now 600. 200 stayed with the supplies. Nabal's response is one of mockery, and I hope you caught this. It's not just of David, but it's of David's father. And if there's something you didn't do in the ancient Israelite world, you don't insult my dad. Don't you do it. Who is this Jesse? While while it's possible that Nabal's words reveal an ignorance about who David is and of his accomplishments at this point in the story, it's highly unlikely. We have textual evidence that suggests this because later in the story, Abigail readily recites who David is and reminds David of all he's accomplished thus far. <laughs> so David, David's known, and it's very likely that Nabal knows exactly who he is, and he is dishonoring David in this moment. This disrespect and shaming is significant. And in response, David is furious. I mean, the text here, right, strap on the swords, let's go. David does not stop to think. He is furious, and he immediately moves towards taking matters into his own hands. By the way, if you're wondering if this is a different aspect of David's character suddenly in front of us, the answer is yes. Yes. He who, right, this story is put right in between two chapters about David's way with Saul, which is our study next week. 
David refuses to take matters into his own hands with Saul who seeks his life. But in this moment of being dishonored, strap on your sword, boys. We're going to war. Or is it war? Is this a little bit more personal? Yeah. We're seeing a new side to David's character. By the way, it's a side I think all of us can relate to. As the story continues, we learned that news of this exchange reaches Abigail's ears. A servant goes to Abigail. This servant is unnamed, but is an equal hero to Abigail in the story because the servant realizes troubles on its way. So the servant goes to Abigail, uh, speaks of what the, the men from David said, and speaks to the truth. And this is all true. They have guarded us against raiding parties. And so Abigail makes a decision, tells the servant to quickly prepare goods for David's men. Once they are prepared, right, quickest lunch meal prepared in history, they are, this, these goods are loaded on the backs of donkeys and they are sent ahead and Abigail follows behind. And oh, by the way, the text tells us that she does not tell Nabal of what she's doing. Smart woman. Abigail meets David Right as he's telling his men that not one man in Nabal's family or workforce will remain alive at the end of this day. So at this point, David's anger is murderous. And let's pick up the story. 1 Samuel 25, verses 23 through 34. We'll begin with verses 23 through 27. When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed down before David with her face to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, pardon your servant, my Lord, and let me speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. Please pay no attention, my Lord, to the wicked man Nabal. He's just like his name. His name means fool and, he, and folly goes with him. And as for me, your servant, I did not see the men my Lord sent. And now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord your God lives, and as you live, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, may your enemies and all who are intent on harming my Lord be like Nabal. And let this gift, which your servant has brought to my Lord, be given to the men who follow you. So Abigail comes in intercession. She's, of course, interceding for her own household. And therefore, she has to necessarily address the foolishness of her husband, and thus she does. But it's not just Nabal and her household that she's coming in intercession for, which really marks Abigail as remarkable in this moment. Notice that she is coming in intercession for David. And she casts vision to him. This Abigail, she casts vision that you will not take matters into your own hands, that you will not avenge yourself. In, in, in David's anger, he had clearly lost sight of one of the qualities that he had prized about himself to this point. Realize that David refused to take vengeance even when his men encouraged him to. Have you ever been in an environment where people are just, oh yeah, come on, this is, this is the thing to do. And in that environment, David said no. But born of offense... David's anger takes over. But here, Abigail shows up in intercession, and Abigail's not done interceding. Verse 28, please forgive your servant's presumption. The Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord because you fight the Lord's battles, and no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live. <laughs> Come on. As the reader, we have to chuckle at times. But I think one, one of the things we have to, to note at this point in the story is we really have not noticed much wrong in David. And he is a, he's on the precipice of a great evil. And Abigail reminds him of who he's supposed to be. Can I just say that a good spouse will always try and do this? This is who you're supposed to be. She's not his spouse. 
yet. Okay. Even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, the life of my Lord will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies he will hurl away as from the pocket of a sling. I wonder if she used that phrasing intentionally. Right? David, Goliath. When the Lord has fulfilled my Lord, every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him ruler over Israel, my Lord, my Lord will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or having avenged himself. And when the Lord your God has brought my Lord success, remember me. Remember your servant. Oh boy, he will. I don't think she could have imagined the way in which he will remember her. Abigail's intercession includes this vision for the king. She has gotten on board. Many in Israel have realized David is the next king. And she cast this vision. Surely, God is sparing you from Saul. We know he's seeking your life. He, as he pursues you, we know that you will be king. And when you become king, can I remind you, David, can I put this vision in front of you? You do not want the staggering burden of needless bloodshed. You will not want to have to reckon with what you're about to do. Wow. She is quite a remarkable person in this moment. Let's, let's finish our, our verses of study, 32 through 34. David said to Abigail, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to meet me. May you be blessed for your good judgment. It's better than mine, essentially what he's saying. And for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. Otherwise, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, who has kept me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, not one male belonging to Nabal would have been left alive by daybreak. David means every word of that. As the story moves towards conclusion in 1 Samuel 25, David, of course, accepts these provisions. He blesses Abigail. Abigail goes home and she finds her, her husband He's just ragingly drunk, right? He's in the midst of his revelry. It's shearing time, food, wine. So he's drunk the next morning. She tells him just how close he came to being killed along with every other male in his household. And it says that he's struck, he's sobered straight. Ten days later, Nabal is dead. The text tells us that the Lord struck him down. And when David learned that Nabal was struck down, he praised God for being just. And then he sent a message to Abigail, I'd like you to become my wife. Now, I, this is a moment, this is going to be the introduction to some moments that we're going to struggle with about David's life. We are a monogamous culture and people. Our monogamous sensibilities are a bit troubled by the fact that as David asks Abigail to be his wife, he's already got two that we are aware of, yeah. By the way, more are coming. <laughs> this was not unusual for an ancient king, but let us recall Deuteronomy 17 tells Israel that they and their kings are not to be like the kings of the nation surrounding them. A king in the ancient world had a harem. One of the privileges of kingship. You had a harem so that, well, outside of what's obvious, but the second is this, so that you could have many sons, many heirs. But the king of Israel was not to be this way. It says in Deuteronomy 17 that the king of Israel was not to have many wives, and the rationale was because through these wives, the king's heart could be moved away from the Lord. And we actually will see how much that becomes true for Israel over the centuries. But here, he, he's already married to a woman from Jezreel. And let's remember Michael. King Saul gave his younger daughter Michael to him. Now, part of the, uh, the odd 
happenings with David and Saul is that at this point, Michael's not with him because as David's running, Saul takes Michael, already given to David, and gives her to another man. I revoke you as my son. So Michael's not with him. Now, Michael will be restored to David. More stories about Michael and David to come, not all of them to our liking. But here he asks, he asks Abigail to be his wife, and the text tells us that she takes her few possessions, and she immediately leaves, and she joins David and becomes his wife. This is 1 Samuel 25. We've taken some time to observe it. We have about five minutes left. Two application points or thoughts for us from the story of David and Abigail. And the first is this. Anger can make us do scary things. Might be an understatement. Anger can make us do scary things. Through Abigail and her wisdom, David is spared egregious behaviors. Later, we'll wish that there was an Abigail at every turn for David's life. There won't always be an Abigail, but at this point in the story, Abigail intercepts David, and her wisdom keeps him from evil. But let us acknowledge that in this story, as well as the greater biblical witness, anger opens a doorway for evil. And sometimes evil almost unchecked. And this is not just true of David. I mean, we're seeing it here being true of David. But as those who follow Jesus, let us also be humble enough to recognize that anger can cause us to do terrible things. Anger causes us to say terrible things, and anger causes us to do terrible things. And let the story of David again bring this in front of us for consideration, repentance, confession, and the aid of the Holy Spirit. We are not left to ourselves. And those of us who are dealing with anger, listen. I don't think I would have ever described myself as an angry human until I became a father. (laughs) Post being the father of four, I can tell you that I've actually had episodes of wrestling with anger that I don't know what to do with. I am certainly not proud of some of the ways I have stewarded my anger. Now, there are others that I would go, ah, the Holy Spirit helped me there. The Holy Spirit was Abigail in that moment for me. The Holy Spirit helped. I have those two. But anger can cause us to say things and do things that are scary. Listen to what the renowned pastor Charles Swindoll wrote in his book about David. Anger is a learned reaction to frustration in which you behave in ways that you would rather not. In fact, severe anger is a form of insanity You are insane whenever you are not in control of your behavior. Therefore, when you are angry and out of control, you are temporarily insane. I actually think he has a point. Because we say and do things in that place that later we're like, dear God, how could I say or do that? Let's listen in on Scripture's instruction around anger. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, teaches us that anger misstewarded and unresolved can lead to tremendous sin and relational brokenness. Based on this teaching, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4 writes, quote, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anger opens a door for the enemy's purposes and activity. And wouldn't it, wouldn't it just be wonderful for us to stop and note that as Paul says, in your anger, do not sin, he's quoting someone. Do you know who he's quoting? David. <laughs> Psalm chapter 4, David. In your anger, do not sin. This was something that David wrestled with. 
And he kept this in front of the Lord. In your anger, do not sin. So I think a lot of us just don't want to be angry. A lot of us really don't like the space that anger moves us towards. Count me in that. I don't like being angry. I don't want to be angry. But anger most commonly is a reaction to something. It's often born, in in the case of David, from some disrespect or offense that's created. It's often born of pain. And often our anger is attached to previous pain that somehow is brought to the surface through a current circumstance. In your anger, do not sin. Listen, you will be provoked to anger. I don't know that the battle is wishing you aren't angry. I think the battle is this. What do you do when you're angry? And what Paul prescribes is actually quite simple and yet extremely challenging. Do not leave it unaddressed before the sun goes down. Talk to the Lord about it. Get it in front of God. A lot of Christians take shame from this because you're like, well, I'm still angry. I'm so hurt. I'm still angry. Of course you are. But the prescription is not that the anger has disappeared. The prescription is this. You get it before the Lord, before the sun goes down. Do not let it go unaddressed. Let the Lord in on it and let him begin to do his work. In the New Testament letter of James, we read this. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So anger is not a highway or a means towards the end of God's righteousness. It will not lead to that. So when angry, we need to learn to process it in a way that allows for the possibility of God's righteousness to find foothold and purchase in our lives. Help us, Holy Spirit. We need the power. Here's, here's the application. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. We need self-control. When angry... We need God's spirit full of wisdom to check us as Abigail did David. David and Abigail, anger can make us do scary things. Secondly, wisdom intercedes for us to wait on the Lord and refrain from evil. You've essentially already heard this. But boy, Abigail acted in tremendous wisdom. And she did numerous practical things that won the moment. And I think this is one of the most remarkable things to discover about Abigail from study, is that the text would strongly suggest she was young. Realize that in ancient Israel, it was not abnormal for a considerably older and established man to marry a much younger woman. Some have suggested even Joseph and Mary were in this scenario. At this point, Nabal is a very well-established man. He's wealthy. It suggests he's probably older. What I'm trying to get at is their marriage was not one that we would, we would recognize readily. It was not a marriage of love as we like to prize in our culture. It was an arranged marriage, and it was the way of ancient Israel. This was still true at the time of Jesus a thousand years later. Abigail's young, and she's probably poor. The text tells us that she takes the little she has, probably given her by her father. She loads up a few donkeys because Nabal's possession will pass to his nearest relative. By the way, did you notice there's no child? Abigail's childless. She has a son for David, by the way. She's able. She's young. She's probably 14 or 15. You married shortly after the onset of puberty. She's, she's like one of the two girls leading us in worship this morning. And she's the one who wins the day in this story. Wisdom can take on many forms and shapes. 
and it can surprise you from whom it comes. Wisdom intercedes for us to wait on the Lord, fear him, and refrain from evil. On this note, listen in to a reflection of David from Psalm 37. It is a wisdom psalm. It's what it's categorized as. Yes, it's a prayer, but it's less a prayer and like an observation of life. That if we partner with God's wisdom, it will go well with us. And if we move in the opposite of that foolishness, it will not. David writes of these two ways and he says this, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. As he writes that, I wonder if Abigail's in front of him, in his mind. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. You know that these words were present in, in the primary teaching of Jesus on the kingdom of heaven. He almost essentially quotes David. Remember, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Jesus agrees with David. David won't always live this way. You and I won't always live this way. But there's the vision of the kingdom of heaven and there's the Holy Spirit to help us. So let's ask for him too. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask for your help. <laughs> because every heart in this room, every life has known what it is to be angry. And we will know what it is to be angry. And we need your help. We want to heed the words, in, in your anger, do not sin. So Holy Spirit, would you lead us towards self-control? Would you lead us towards that which accomplishes your right ways in the earth? And would you spare us and deliver us from evil? We trust you for this, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.